This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Hello, everyone. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I look a little flat here. Let's, uh, oh, there we go. There's the, the color correction kicking in. All right, how is everyone today? Hello, Jan and Lost, Hero, and uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go lie, and Steve and Chim. Give everybody a chance to get in here for a moment as we get started. Uh, what's happened is really, I mean, kind of remarkable. So you have John Bolton, who's the national security advisor, or should I say former national security advisor of the United States, and he writes a book about all of you know things that happen at his job like his memoirs and stuff but of course he's the national security advisor so he's got to have like a line where he can't post or write about you know or, or publish certain national security things you know secrets top secret whatever well there's a particular level of top secret that they're going to debate here um, there was a hearing on Friday and the public was invited to join and we managed to get in before the lines all filled up and, and closed. And the hearing was mostly between the government arguing that there are top secret, what's more than top secret, I think it's called CLI or something. Um, there's these really highly top secret classified things in this book and that Bolton needed to get written permission to release those secrets and since he didn't get written permission books should not be released and although the book is mostly released already that's bolton's problem and the judge should order him to do everything he can to unrelease the book bolton on the other hand was saying wait a second of course i i know that i have secrets and i signed non-disclosure agreements and everything but the wording of the contracts and the non-disclosure agreement says i only need to get written permission if there is this top secret classified stuff in the book which there isn't and i spent 10 hours in a conference room with another uh, government official I, i'll forget who um and, and, and he's going to say that he cleared it with them verbally and they confirmed that there's no top secret information in there that needs to be further cleared so he didn't need to get written permission. So it's a real interesting issue there. <clears throat> and fortunately, Judge Lamberth has distilled that whole big dispute down into a 10 page opinion, which we're going to cover now. Thank you, Ink Boy, for the two euros hat. Not silly enough here for the funds for the silly hat. Why am I wearing a cowboy hat? Because one of the major arguments on Bolton's side is the horse has left the barn. They're, they're, you're not going to go catch the horse right away. It's too late. It's already left the barn. Might as well, you know, let the horse run around and pasture for a little while because you ain't getting it back in. So that's what Bolton's argument is. And the other half of that was, of course, the government's argument that that's his problem. He has to go corral the horse and get it back in the barn. So let's see what the judge has to say about this. So this is in the D.C. Uh, District Court. So the District Court for the District of Columbia. And this is the United States of America versus John R. Bolton. I mean, how how fun would that be just to get a lawsuit against you like United States of America versus Leonard French? Like, no, please. No, I don't want that. Please don't ever do that. This is a memorandum order, and we're here on a motion for a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction. These are two different but very similar things. So similar but different. Uh, both ask the court to issue a injunction against doing or not doing something for a party. Uh, the temporary restraining order is usually ex parte, is usually without the other party's presence and arguments. The preliminary injunction is with the other party. The temporary restraining order is for the first 14 days, and the preliminary injunction is supposed to be for the rest of the of the, of the case until the case is decided and then if an injunction is still warranted then it's a permanent injunction that gets issued then so the court says before the court is the government's motion for a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction to enjoin defendant john bolton from publishing his book 
the book, a political memoir reflecting on Bolton's tenure as national security advisor has been printed, bound and shipped across the country. It is due for national release Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. The government insists that the book contains sensitive information that could compromise national security and alleges that Bolton prematurely halted his publication review process in order to proceed to publication. Defendant Bolton characterizes his actions differently. He emphasizes his substantial and extensive compliance with the review process and dismisses the government's recent objections to his manuscripts as pretextual and politically motivated. While Bolton's unilateral conduct raises grave national security concerns, the government has not established that an injunction is an appropriate remedy. Now, I think the judge will go over the standard for an injunction, but usually the standard rests heavily upon irreparable injury. No other remedy can be had. No monetary remedy will suffice. There, there There's going to be damage done here that can't be repaired. Um, and Spoiler alert, the judge says here there is already damage that's been done and there's nothing the court's going to do to stop it. So not irreparable in the, in, the, in the injunctive sense. John Bolton accepted a role as National Security Advisor in April of 2018. In this position, Bolton directed and supervised the work of the National Security Council staff on behalf of the president. He left his post on September 10th, 2019. Within two months, Bolton had secured a book deal with publisher Simon & Schuster. The government anticipates that public officials will seek to publish accounts of their experience with those officials when those officials have access to sensitive information that implicates national security. The government guards that information by conditioning employment on a guarantee of non-disclosure. Bolton accepted this condition of employment and executed multiple non-disclosure agreements with the government. In one agreement, Standard Form 312, you're going to hear that again, I think, Bolton agreed that he would never divulge classified information to anyone unless he has officially verified that the recipient has been properly authorized by the United States government to receive it, or he has been given prior written notice of authorization from the United States government that such disclosure is permitted. In the event Bolton was uncertain about the classification status of information, he was required to confirm from an authorized official that the information is unclassified before he may disclose it. Violation could result in assigning to the United States government all royalties, remunerations, and emoluments that have resulted, will result, or may result from any disclosure, publication, or revelation of classified information not consistent with the terms of that agreement, SF-312. Bolton agreed to abide by the restrictions in SF-312 unless and until he is released in writing by an authorized representative of the United States government. Another agreement, Form 4414, detailed conditions Bolton must follow to gain access to highly classified sensitive information, the SCI, excuse me, SCI. Here, Bolton agreed to submit for security review any writing or other preparation in any form that contains or purports to contain SCI or description of activities that produce or relate to SCI or that ha he has or that he has reason to believe are derived from SCI that he contemplates disclosing to any person not authorized to have access to SCI or that he has prepared for public disclosure. Bolton promised not to disclose the contents of such preparation with or show it to anyone who is not authorized to have access to SCI until he had received written authorization that such disclosure is permitted. In December 2019, Bolton submitted a draft manuscript to the NSC, National Security Council, for pre-publication review. Over the following four months, so December 2019, January, February, March, a little bit into April, Bolton worked to incorporate the edits he received from the Senior Director for Records Access and Information Security Management at the NSC, Ellen Knight. These edits were iterative and extensive, and on April 27, 2020, Knight communicated to Bolton that she no longer considered the manuscript to contain classified material. Bolton 
claims that he and Knight discussed the possibility that the final written authorization might be ready as early as that afternoon. The written authorization did not issue, and Knight soon clarified that the process was ongoing. Weeks passed without further communication between Bolton and the government. On June 8th, John Eisenberg, Deputy White House Counsel and Legal Advisor to the NSC, issued a letter to Bolton that claimed the manuscript still contained classified information. By that point, Bolton had already delivered a final manuscript to his publisher for printing and shipping without written authorization and without notice to the government. What is the government asking this court to do about it? Its proposed order seeks a temporary restraining order or preliminary injunction that would 1. Enjoin Bolton from proceeding with the publication of his book in any form or media without first obtaining the written authorization from the United States through the pre-publication review process. 2. Require Bolton to ensure that his publisher and resellers receive notice that the book contains classified information that he was not authorized to disclose. 3. Require Bolton to instruct his publisher to delay the release date of the book pending the completion of the pre-publication review process and authorization from the United States that no classified information remains in the book. 4. Require Bolton to instruct his publisher to take any and all available steps to retrieve and destroy any copies of the book that may be in the possession of any third party. 5. Enjoin Bolton from taking any additional steps towards publicly disclosing classified information without first obtaining authorization from the United States through the pre-publication review process. And 6. Require Bolton to ensure that his publisher and resellers receive notice of the injunction. The government does not name Simon & Schuster as a defendant in the case. Instead, the government seeks to secure Simon & Schuster's compliance by way of enjoining Bolton. Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 65D2 instructs that an injunction or TRO binds not only the parties, but also the parties, officers, agents, servants, employees, and attorneys, and all other persons who are in active concert or participation with the parties if they receive actual notice of the order. On to the legal standard. A preliminary injunction is an extraordinary remedy. The movement must make a clear showing that four factors taken together warrant relief. The four factors are 1. A substantial likelihood of success on the merits of the case. 2. That the movement would suffer irreparable injury if the injunction were not granted. 3. That an injunction would not substantially injure other interested parties. Four, that the public interest would be furthered by the injunction. In the past, the D.C. Circuit has applied a sliding scale approach to the four factors, holding that injunctive relief may be granted with either a high likelihood of success and some injury, or vice versa. The Supreme Court, however, suggests that the sliding scale approach has fallen out of favor. In the Winter case, the court specifically stated that regardless of a movement's high likelihood of success on the merits, he or she still must demonstrate that irreparable injury is likely in the absence of an injunction. The D.C. Circuit has expressly declined to address the viability of the sliding scale approach post-winter case, stating that we need not decide whether that approach is still viable because the movements fail even under the sliding scale analysis. Other courts have found that winter prohibits the use of the sliding scale approach. Then Judge Kavanaugh's concurrence in the Davis case dismissed the applicability of a sliding scale approach because Winter requires a movement to meet four independent requirements to obtain injunctive relief. This court will apply the standards set forth in Winter. The government must clearly establish all four factors. Discussion. Is the government likely to succeed on the merits? Yes. That's a that's a bombshell right there. Bolton disputes that his book contains any such classified information and emphasizes his months-long compliance with the pre-publication review process. He bristles at the mixed messages sent by pre-publication review personnel and questions the motives of intelligence officers. Bolton could have sued the government and sought relief in court. Yeah, the, the government the attorneys made a big deal about this, that he was supposed to sue in, in court and get relief there before publishing the book, not now, not, not while it's in the middle of being published without written authorization. 
Instead, he opted out of the review process before its conclusion. Unilateral fast tracking carried the benefit of publicity and sales and the cost of substantial risk exposure. This was Bolton's bet. If he is right and the book does not contain classified information, he keeps the upside mentioned above. But if he is wrong, he stands to lose his profits from the book deal, expose himself to criminal liability, and imperil national security. Bolton was wrong. The government submitted classified declarations for the court's ex parte review in camera, so uh, without the other party and, and on its own, like the court is going to review it in chambers, like on its own. On June 19th, 2020, so yes, yes two days ago? yesterday. The court held a sealed ex parte hearing in further in-camera review with the government, so that's in chambers with the government, upon reviewing the classified materials as well as the declarations filed on the public docket, the court is persuaded that defendant Bolton likely jeopardized national security by disclosing classified information in violation of his non-disclosure agreement obligations. Bolton was the national security advisor to the president. He was entrusted with countless national secrets and privy to countless sensitive dealings. To Bolton, this is a selling point. His book is entitled The Room Where It Happened. He rushed to write an account of his behind closed doors experiences and produced over 500 pages of manuscript for review. Not four months later, Bolton pulled the plug on the process and sent the still under review manuscript to the publisher for printing. Many Americans are unable to renew their passports within four months. Okay, okay, wait a second. That's not true. I, I, I think I did pay for expedited renewal, but I got it in like two and a half weeks. It really wasn't that bad. And expedited renewal wasn't that expensive compared, but I get you, I get you. But Bolton complains that reviewing hundreds of pages of a national security advisor's tell-all deserves a swifter timetable. Access to sensitive intelligence is rarely consolidated in individuals, and it comes as no surprise to the court that the government requested several iterations of review headed by multiple officers. But what is reasonable to the court was intolerable to Bolton, and he proceeded to publication without so much as an email notifying the government. It is well settled that a mandated pre-publication review process is not an unconstitutional prior restraint. So in other words, it doesn't implicate the First Amendment's uh, freedom of speech requirements. So not. This circuit upheld the Central Intelligence Agency's pre-publication review scheme in McGehee v. Casey, a D.C. Circuit uh, of Appeals, 1983 case. There, the Appeals Circuit held that the government has a substantial interest in assuring secrecy in the conduct of foreign intelligence operations. First Amendment rights are preserved so long as restrictions protect a substantial government interest unrelated to the suppression of free speech, and the restriction is narrowly drawn to restrict speech in no more than is necessary to protect the substantial government interest, otherwise known as strict scrutiny or strict, strict constitutional scrutiny. The Supreme Court agrees this court cases, this court's cases make clear that even in the absence of an express agreement, the CIA can act to protect substantial government interests by imposing reasonable restrictions on employee activities that in other contexts might be protected by the First Amendment. For the purposes of resolving this motion, the court is satisfied that the government's pre-publication review of Bolton's book fell within these bounds. So remember, we're at the beginning of a case. This is a temporary restraining order or preliminary injunction. The case will go on. The government and Bolton will exchange information in discovery. They will then make either summary judgment motions or the case will go to trial. And then we'll decide whether Bolton's book really does violate national security or otherwise contain sensitive classified information that should not have been released. But there's, there's more. The NDAs barred publication of classified materials. Bolton likely published classified materials. The government likely will succeed on the merits, but a single factor is not sufficient for an injunction to issue. The court now proceeds to the second.
Will the government suffer irreparable injury if an injunction is not granted? The government has not carried its burden of establishing that an injunction will prevent irreparable injury. At the hearing on the injunction, the court remarked that given the widespread dissemination of the books, the horse is already out of the barn. According to Simon & Schuster Chief Executive Jonathan Karp's affidavit, more than 200,000 copies of the book have already been shipped domestically to retail booksellers large and small from large national chains and online entities to a host of small independent booksellers. Indeed, thousands of copies of the book have been shipped to booksellers around the world, including in continental Europe, India, and the Middle East. Reviews and excerpts from the book are widely available online. As noted at the hearing, a CBS News reporter clutched a copy of the book while questioning the White House press secretary. By the looks of it, the horse is not just out of the barn, it is out of the country. Counsel for the government still press for an injunction. In its motion, the government asked this court to order Bolton to instruct his publisher to take any and all available steps to retrieve and destroy any copies of the book that may be in possession of any third party. For reasons that hardly need be stated, the court will not order a nationwide seizure and destruction of a political memoir. So... Unless this is some elaborate conspiracy by the government to promote the book by pretending that the horse is out of the barn and they're trying to get it back in and it's a big kerfuffle, it sounds like the book actually might contain classified information and I'm looking forward to my copy when it arrives. If nothing else, the government argues, an injunction today would at least prevent any further spread of the book, such as limiting its audiobook release, which is, that's my copy. The argument is unavailing. In taking it upon himself to publish his book without securing final approval from national intelligence authorities, Bolton may indeed have caused the country irreparable harm, but in the internet age, even a handful of copies in circulation could irrevocably destroy confidentiality. A single dedicated individual with a book in hand could publish its contents far and wide from his local coffee shop. With hundreds of thousands of copies around the globe, many in newsrooms, the damage is done. There is no restoring the status quo. Quick interruption. I used to do this. Not the piracy part, but I used to actually take my law books to the local Kinko's, FedEx Kinko's, and have them strip the spine off the book with that big machine that like clamps it and cuts it. And then I would put them through a automatic document feeder scanner so I could put them on my Kindle And then eventually I got an iPad and used to do all of my highlighting and everything on an iPad because I don't know if you're aware, but those books are really big. And by the time I got through an entire day's or week's worth of books, I had like 40, 50 pounds worth of books. So being able to put that all on an iPad and highlight it out and then, you know, you can do this stuff with it like we're showing you here. Oh, it's technology is great. Remarking on the same, counsel for Bolton questioned the government's standing to seek a preliminary injunction. Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution requires a plaintiff to allege injury in fact, causation, and redressability. That's standing. Relief that does not remedy the injury suffered cannot bootstrap a plaintiff into federal court. That is the very essence of the redressability requirement in standing. A plaintiff must demonstrate standing for each claim he seeks to press and for each form of relief that is sought. While the government has made its case for injury and cause, this court could reframe the factor to reasoning above as demonstrating a lack of redressability. Rather than delve into full justiciability analysis, the court is content to rely on both the winter factors and the standing argument as sufficient grounds for denial. The court, therefore, need not reach further First Amendment concerns in its current posture. Would an injunction substantially injure other interested parties, and would the public interest be furthered by an injunction? In keeping with the above, any injunction considered by this court would be so toothless as to not substantially injure anyone. 
and perhaps the public interest would be nominally served by the gesture, but an injunction remains an untimely solution. Resolving these third and fourth winter factors in the government's favor does not retrieve or revive the motion's prospects. Conclusion. Defendant Bolton has gambled with the national security of the United States. He has exposed his country to harm and himself to civil and potentially criminal liability. But these facts do not control the motion before the court. The government has failed to establish that an injunction will prevent irreparable harm. Its motion is accordingly denied. It is so ordered, and that is Judge Royce C. Lamberth. That's the same judge that threw Strike Three Holdings, our favorite copyright troll, right out of D.C. court, and that's now being appealed to the D.C. circuit. We're following that story separately. So this is really interesting. Bolton, if the judge is right, and Bolton doesn't have the right to publish this manuscript or book, then Bolton probably is criminally liable in some way and will forego all the profits from the book. And I don't know what else the government can hit him with, but definitely they'll end up taking his profits from the book. So he writes the book, he hopes for this windfall of profits, and then nothing, and then the government takes it, is basically what happens there. So interesting situation. He, uh, if if this is really the way, because again, this is this is preliminary. This is a preliminary injunction that's been denied or a temporary restraining order has been denied. So now we go on to trial. Now we go on to litigation, and we get to find out the actual facts that will be found by the court. And Judge Lambert or a jury will find the facts later on, and those will be the facts that that can still be appealed. But appealing facts is difficult. We normally give a lot of deference to the fact finder. Appealing law is easy so how the law operates on the facts if they get that wrong that's an easy appeal but i mean relatively easy if you if you get the facts wrong but the jury and the judge found those facts you have a high burden to uh, to over overcome that uh, that uh, those those incorrect facts so we'll find out the found facts later but taking these facts that the judge has found as true it sounds like Bolton wrote his book quickly to get a quick profit, went through the review process, was unhappy with the delay of the review process, got sort of that suspicion that you might get, you know, when you work with thieves, <laughs> when you work with untrustworthy people, that maybe they're delaying because they don't like you or because they don't like what you had to say, not because it actually involves the merits of national security. Um, sounds like he pulled the plug on the review process or, or, or went around the review process and authorized the release of his book, even though he hadn't received that written authorization. And if his book does ultimately contain national security secrets, then he's screwed in in that sense. And I don't know, this sounds like the government wants to go after him for it. Now, if he if it doesn't contain sensitive national security information or secrets or C, SCI or whatever, then uh, then I guess he's gambled Then he's clear. And look at all the public look at all the publicity. He sold all these copies of this book. Um, so. Uh, even I bought a copy. So he's got all this money now, or he will have all the money from the book, but uh, it all depends on whether his book really did contain sensitive national security information. So super interesting situation. This uh, this is the book. This is the, the, the book that the controversy is all about. It's called The Room Where It Happened. It's a White House memoir. No, I didn't think ahead and give you a like uh, Amazon link. Um, where you can go purchase this, although maybe I can create one really quickly here. But um, it is it is literally a, a book he wrote in just, it sounds like a few months or a little under a year. And I'm not, uh, I, you know, you, you could easily make the argument that the guy did it for profit. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to make this link in time. So who cares? Anyway, so the room where it happened... A White House memoir by John Bolton seems like it will be released on December, December? <laughs> it was saying December, I'm reading December 2019 in front of me, that it will be released uh, on Tuesday, June 23rd, so just a couple days, and we'll all find out whether it was worth it or not, and then the case will go on, and either John Bolton gets his windfall from the book, 
and all this publicity from it. Could you imagine if this was if this was all like a staged thing, like they wanted him to sell the book or he wanted to sell more books. So so he wanted this controversy to create this dry sand effect to sell more books. That'd be really clever. I don't know that I have the courage to take that kind of chance, but good good for people who no, I don't know about I don't know. I don't know if that's good. Good for them, but I don't know about good for us. Anyway, that's our show. Get your super chats and your comments in on uh, the chat while we got it open. Um, put your comments below once we've closed the chat here and let me do my little outro here. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is a community supported legal education channel, Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education channel. And it is supported by you, our viewers, and, and a little bit of YouTube uh, advertising revenue too. But your monthly support keeps us going, keeps us paying our people. You actually help support now three people have jobs because of Lawful Masses, me and Brandon and Tech. So thank you very much to the June $50 plus supporters. Thank you, Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Michael Pierce, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen, Ada, Cute Grills in Your Area, Longreach Jones, Definitely Not Prenda Law, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Josh Baker, uh, Gregory, Rudolph Bescherer Jr., Christian Hellman, Jay Dixon, Ammonite, Oscar the Prophet, and Hot Grills in your area. And the $5 plus supporters are scrolling on the LED panel back there, and everybody will be in the description. I think you already are in the description of the videos below. Thank you to Ink Boy for the two euro super chat. Hat not silly enough. Here are funds for a silly hat. Yes, we have some other silly hats. I think we have a... Uh, I think we have a, uh, a pirate hat here someplace, but we'll save that for a pirate show. So anyway, I'll let you go. Have a great Saturday. Love you all. Bye.